Okay, and we are live. Everybody, how things? Hey guys, how's it going? This is Jason with massive pleasure. I have the ability to introduce this wonderful man who was working with TSD in terms of helping people overcome many psychological obstacles. And of course, as I'm sure you're beginning to understand everyone, there's more to weight loss than just moving more and eating less. So Jason, if you could start right from the beginning, let us know why you did in college and university. And of course, what kind of brought you to where you are now? Uh, okay, cool. Um, well, I suppose my kind of journey with all this began when I was about 30, actually. Um, kind of switched careers and went back to study uh, psychology in Trinity College, Dublin. And did four years there, came out of it and actually took a year's break and then was trying to figure out what I was going to do, uh, kind of, you know, where I was going to go with this psychology degree and, and maybe who was going to help. Mm -hmm. And so I came across a master's in Cork. And the master's was on the psychology of happiness and the psychology of coaching. So I suppose wow. the idea with it was is that, you know, there's an awful lot in terms of this, uh, the psychology around well-being and living a good life and, and the kind of things that make us happy. And I suppose the coaching then was a tool to kind of help implement all that. Um, so really when I'm all about, I suppose, a couple of different areas, uh, it will be performance and productivity. So I suppose it's getting the results you want and getting the important things done, uh, personal and professional developments, and then happiness and well-being, you know. Um, what else so is there? What, <laughs> what else is there than that? Like happiness and well-being. I'm sorry to stop you there, but everyone's saying hello. Kirsty Smith, who's just joined Elite Visit. Massive welcome to Kirsty. Julia Rye is here. So is Jane Stoneball, Helen Boyle, Andrea Pierce, Maria Paulette. Yeah. We've only been on, I said, two minutes. There's 41, literally two minutes. Wow. 41 watching, 26 comments. Um, Maureen, hello. So, guys, have a think of some questions for Jason. He'll be Please. answering a few in a few That'd moments. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, tell me, how did it go, first of all, in, in both Trinity and in Cork? Uh, great. You know, it was, I suppose, going back, it's 10, 11 years ago now since I started in Trinity, I suppose, and Cork is maybe five or six so it was really good experience going back a little bit later. I kind of had really figured out what it is that I wanted to do. You know, I suppose I spent a lot of my 20s kind of bouncing around with various ideas and various occupations and jobs and quite successful in a few of them, but never really had that internal, that, that intrinsic motivation, I suppose, you know, the, the kind of, I suppose I'm very lucky in terms of what I do for a living in that I would probably do it for free, do you know, that kind of way when you, you know, because you get such really nice feedback off people and it's, I suppose it fits my personality, et cetera, et cetera, as well. But it's a very rewarding job. Um, I suppose, I'm not sure if there's too many to go, like, I'm not sure if there's a lot of people who I've done sessions with, uh, but one of the really nice things about it, I mean, and I've got some of the quotes here as well, but some of the really nice feedback you get off people um, and the really nice comments and, you know, with a lot of people I've seen for maybe 50 minutes, but, you know, I suppose hearing them amazing stories and hearing them, some of the stuff you guys have pulled off and that you're doing in your day-to-day -day lives, uh, absolutely incredible. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very rewarding job, I suppose. I can literally only imagine. I mean, in terms of what you do, I think it's, I have such a personal interest in it, Jason. I mean, you know, if I was to go back to college, I think that's what I would want to do. And and on that note, like you said, you, you went back to college around the age of 30. You know, that, obviously that takes courage to go back in at perhaps the later age than the 18, 19 year old, you know. So if you don't mind sharing, what, what kind of gave you the courage to say, you know what, I'm not fully sat satisfied. And the reason why I'm asking is because there will be dozens of people watching this who are in jobs that perhaps are not their dream or their passion. So what was it that gave you the courage to do something like that? Um, well, I suppose just to make the point about, you know, not being in your dream job per se, first thing I'd say about that is jobs are not always everything. That I suppose in terms of that meaning and, and in terms of that purpose to your life, you can get that in lots of different areas. That sometimes a job is there to serve another purpose. Um, I was lucky enough that I didn't have a wife and kids and I didn't have a mortgage and I was able to do that. Um, so in terms of courage, I would say I didn't have to be as brave as I've seen some people in university, some amazing stories. Uh, 
there was one guy in the year ahead of me in my psychology undergraduate who was 66 when he graduated. And, you know, like he had went back at that age to do it and he was so in love with it and obsessed with it. Um, so I couldn't say I was particularly brave, to be honest. I was lucky is the way I would phrase it, that I suppose things were set up and I had to work very hard and, and you know, you don't get anything without working hard. But at the same time, I suppose I was very, very blessed. I had a lot of support from the people close to my life, which is, again is another very important factor. So I wouldn't necessarily say it was courage, um, but uh, a certain amount of it was luck and a certain amount of it was, I suppose, to put my head down and slowly but surely figuring things out and, and kind of having faith that it would work out, you know? Yeah. I just love that. And I know you've been a very humble man. And by the way, I've met Jason in public, everybody one in public in person <laughs> he is one of the most genuine and kind individuals ever like even when he first came to tsd his primary goal was well we have to make sure this is actually going to help people and i'm like you are literally on the same page you <laughs> you could not have said a better thing right now so right now loads of people are here sassy helen quinn maria elaine taylor loads of people singing your praises here jason awesome thanks so much no, uh, no i don't too. have direct access to the comments but uh i'd love to i'll have a look at them later on oh I'll my gosh i'm time. telling you it's nuts here susan susan logan for example changed the way i work i used to do without breaks and we discussed how to overcome this and implemented the strategies and now i no longer feel guilty about taking a break that is a small <laughs> thing that is monumental if it's something that happens every day would you agree with that absolutely um, you'd be amazed what you can do with, I suppose, this idea of compounding, you know, that if, if you're changing a little bit every day and over a couple of weeks, over a couple of months, you know, little tweaks can do amazing things. Um, I mean, and sometimes, you know, doing a little bit less allows you to do an awful lot more in the long run. Mm. You need you need your rest and you need to, I suppose, be kind to yourself enough too. And, and you know, I think a lot of things with people not taking breaks, we get sucked into computers, we get sucked into machines. It's very important to move, you know, at least once an hour to get up. Um, I like to do just simple things like squats, but any kind of movement, we're designed to move. We're not designed to be sitting at a desk, staring at a computer um, and just having information kind of put into us. In terms of your learning, the one thing I can guarantee in terms of your ability to learn, your ability to process information, your ability to think is all very, very much got to do with your body. In fact, this is an actual scientific fact. The one thing that has been shown to make you cognitively smarter is either cardio or strength-based exercise crazily enough. Mm -hmm. uh, no supplements. It's not a case of learning stuff and sitting down. In terms of your ability to process information, uh, those two types of exercise. Crazy. I love that. And of course, it's all going in the one direction. It's all literally on brand in terms of what we're trying to do here, which is help people lose weight, but most importantly, sustain that weight loss. So I love what you did in terms of university. I mean, happiness and well-being. Like, again, as I said earlier, there's not many things that are more important than that. So would you mind going through a couple of perhaps pillars or a couple of things that you feel are the fundamentals in, in terms of happiness from what you've learned in university? Yeah, well, I suppose it's a big question. Um, you, can go, you can come at it from a couple of different angles. Um, I suppose in terms of, you can think of happiness, first off, it's a very different thing than avoiding sadness or avoiding negative emotion. Often we think of uh, positive emotion and negative emotion as being on a spectrum. It's not actually true. Um, very different parts of your brain uh, process both. So I suppose in terms of happiness, Lots of different pillars to it, but the main source of happiness we have in our lives, the main source of positive emotion is when we move towards a goal that we think is important. We make pro progress. And that progress can be in your relationships. It can be in your career. It can be in any domain you want. I mean, a lot of what we do here is around your health and your health behaviors. But making progress towards a goal that you think is important is really the main source of happiness that you can get. Um, very much linked to things like uh, our relationships. You know, happiness to an extent is other people. Um, it's also very much linked to this idea of flow and I suppose having something that you think is important but that you can get sucked into and that it can take up your time. So, I mean, I see with what Alex does and I suppose this whole organization and this whole business, 
I mean, I guarantee you have days, Alex, where you're so absorbed in it that, you know, suddenly you look up and there's four or five hours have passed and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that time went. So, <laughs> have you been um, hiding in my office, have you? <laughs> Absolutely. And Absolutely. So, there's, so there's lots of different pillars, but I would say like, you know, the main takeaway for me from studying all this for years is that the main source of happiness, the main source of positive emotion we have is when we move towards a goal that we think is important. And there's other sources of so things like gratitude, which I know you guys do an awful lot around, Optimism, very, very important, you know, and optimism seems to be very much linked to uh, our motivation. So I suppose if we don't think that what we're doing is going to have the results that we're aiming for, then why would we bother trying, you know? Um, so that, you know, I suppose that's positive psychology in uh, a nutshell, those few sentences. The relationships, progress towards something that you're obviously care about, health, 100%. I think that um, if you have processes of having progress, health, I also find having having a purpose as well. Um, mm -hmm. But you makes me happy anyway. Well, that's the, you know, so I suppose if we can make progress towards anything, it feels good. Uh, this is why video games work. So you have Mario is running through an imaginary world, collecting imaginary prizes, making imaginary progress. And that's I, if any of you have ever played video games, still quite satisfying. Yeah, yeah. But if you magnify that, then it's something important to you. It's something you value. So I mean, I'm sure you guys do. You guys do a lot of work on your why, you know. And I suppose that is the importance of that. And, and I suppose the trick is to try and kind of take that abstract conception of a why and actually bring it into your day to day and into your momentary decisions, you know. Um, Easier said than done sometimes, but uh, you know that's the that's the secret to it, as far as I can see. Hundred percent. And those of you who don't know what the why is, so guys, when someone starts in sustainable change, or does one of our programs, the first thing I'm going to ask them is, what are your whys? What are your top three reasons as to why you're making you a priority? And if you have strong enough whys, it means if you get knocked back, if you have a slip, if you have a struggle, you can revisit those whys, and it keeps you moving forward. So those of you watching here, guys. I would like you to please comment your three whys. If you're in sustainable change in Elite and Elite Physique, please comment your three whys right now. I guarantee you that's going to help someone watching who's not in a program just now. Question from Carrie. Any advice on ways to prioritize? I tend to see everything as important, then get overwhelmed. What a question, by the way. Yeah, uh, what a question indeed. Um, a tactic or a strategy I like to use sometimes is what's called the evil genie. Oh. So what I get people to do is I get them to write out a list of everything. So, you know, in terms of their priorities, et cetera. Um, what I do is I'm going to pretend I'm an, easy, I'm an evil genie. I'm going to take one of them away, but you have to choose which one. And so people will pick one and the first one isn't usually so hard. And then what we'll do is we start moving up that list. And every time you have to take one away. Um, and I suppose the nice thing about that is in one way, you can't see how really important things are. You can kind of start to judge your emotional reaction. But when you're forced to make a decision on stuff, you can kind of start to get an idea for, you might necessarily like it. And I suppose that would be a big part of the work <laughs> that I would often do with people is sometimes making the right decision doesn't necessarily feel good immediately. Uh, but you know, which would you prefer? You know, sometimes you do have to, you do have to make decisions that don't feel particularly good in the moment, but in the long term, they're going to make you feel an awful lot happier. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So trying to avoid, I suppose, immediate gratification for something that will serve you in so many more ways. And I'm, I'm assuming that is linked with being able to see progress. If it doesn't make you happy right away, perhaps it's because it takes time for you to see progressing. Is that, is that about right? Or what do you think? Um, well, the immediate gratification problem, I mean, I think that's a certain amount of it's in framing. Um, so what are you focused on in, in a moment? You know, we're often focused on the pleasure or the pain, you know, so the sweet or the fatty food tastes good right now. The, the exercise hurts right now or it's tired, tiring or, or it's exhausting, you know, and, and that's that kind of external motivation. We, we respond to re reward and punishment. We respond to pleasure and pain, you know, 
Uh, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be the case, you know. Um, sometimes when we've got something more important to do, we can overcome that, you know, we can push through. Um, I mean, I'm sure you can all think of examples in your work or dealing with your family or dealing with things you haven't really felt like doing something, but you'll do it anyway, you know. And so we have that in us. I mean, a lot of the work I would do with people in the one-to-ones is, you know, getting very clear conceptions around everything that's going on with that and then trying to harness that deeper inner kind of reasons. Yeah. Um, so those inner reasons are very much, I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, there's a book, it's quite good on this called Drive. Is that, a, is that on your reading list? Nope. Mad to hear about it though. <laughs> More of a businessy kind of idea, I suppose, but it's, you know, we've, we've got these three basic needs or drives as humans. You know, we've a need for autonomy or independence and freedom. We have a need for relatedness or connection with other people. And we have a need for, what is the phrase that he uses? As, uh, linked to its competence, I suppose, would be the phrase that he uses. I mean, my understanding on it is, is about being the person that you want to be. You know, it's, it's about being a capable kind of person in the world. And so most things kind of boil back down to this kind of these kind of three base motivations. I mean, we like to be free. We like to be autonomous. We like to be able to be in control of our own world. We like to have connection with other people. And we also like to I suppose be competent, be of value, to be of use, you know. Um, and if you take... I could probably guess with most of your whys, you could probably relate them back to those three things that, that want to be independent, that want to connect with, with other people somehow, or that want to be of value, that want to be of service. Yeah. I think that's why perhaps giving back is so powerful. If you feel like you've helped someone, that's it's just so fulfilling, so fulfilling. And in terms of prioritizing things, one thing that I've learned over the years is that doing the most important thing all the time isn't necessarily the best bit of a life because sometimes you might have low energy you might be exhausted you might not be your best and being able to recognize that and perhaps being kind to yourself like you said jason literally 20 minutes ago being kind to yourself and perhaps having decompression time or things that aren't the most important thing to do but they're enjoyable rewarding or allow you to reset to get you back to your prime state mm. any thoughts on that at all jason or what do you think yeah, I mean, it, it's something that we forget. I mean, I mean, I spoke about that those that ten minute break, and, and I suppose a lot of the other side of what I do in terms of my other business is, is helping people pre perform at their best. Mm. And that kind of break idea, again, it's not very intuitive. But this idea of being kind to ourselves and being nice to ourselves, it's so so important. Um, very good book on. The, the idea is uh, Taming Your Inner Gremlin by Rick Carson, if you ever come across it. But so a lot of the work he kind of does is about, we have this inner critic, we have this nasty little voice inside of us that tells us, you know, we have to do more, we have to be better. And what that little voice sometimes misses is the fact that, you know, we do need to recharge and we do need to be nice to ourselves. And really we need to get our, basic basic needs met you know or like our needs for I suppose rest is a big one but also our needs for security our needs for relationships our needs you know uh, and if we don't get these needs met regardless of how much willpower or how determined we are to do something eventually there's something inside us will kick and fight back and eventually like you know it'll, it'll just demotivate us you know and, and I suppose sometimes you have these almost subconscious kind of battles with herself that are very interesting um you know i mean i think it's a really interesting i think about behavior change a lot of the time is we have these two narratives you know we have one narrative is you know i want to do the right thing i want to do the exercise i want to not eat that piece of cake and on the other side you've got that other narrative which is oh you know actually i don't want to do the exercise or i do want to eat the piece of cake and the issue is is that if you batter down that narrative or if you batter down either one of these narratives what do you think happens i mean so if you're not allowing like a voice inside you to, to speak what do you think happens eventually you give in or you you yeah. stop, 
something happens. Like yeah, that. you know. So it's very important to acknowledge these things and to be curious. I think being curious is is such an important thing with all this. And um, but this is why I think that meditation and um, seem to have such a strong effect. What they do is they allow you to kind of observe these kind of stories and these voices that we all have and these conflicting kind of uh, motivations, so to speak, and rather than just react to them um, by either trying to shove them away or going along with the story, what we can do is kind of just actually have a look at them for what they are and appreciate them, but it doesn't mean we have to act in line with them. If Acknowledge you know. it, but not lie down to it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you mentioned behavior change. There are some things that we do right now with everyone in TSD is you know, we talk about discipline, but I'm a firm believer that it's not about being disciplined mm. in your decisions. I feel it's more appropriate to be disciplined in your environment. If you're disciplined in your environment to minimize temptation, life is just so much easier. You know, you've heard the expression, birds of a feather flock together. If you surround yourself with a community like this, like Jane, like Susan, like Rita, like Carrie, who are all commenting below, it, it means that you're, you're with like-minded people. But if you go down to the pub every night and you have a Diet Coke and you like alcohol, you're less likely to be able to stay away from it if you put yourself in that environment. So I think mm -hmm. discipline for me should be around curbing our environment to make us well more make it easier on ourselves rather than making it more challenging and i know a huge amount of what you've done in university jason is around procrastination and how to how to prevent it have you a couple of things perhaps you could share that you would typically work with with, with clients in tsd or what have you used in the past that you found very effective there is, so I suppose, first off on that, I have a full hour on procrastination on my YouTube, if you want to check it out, uh, to give you the gory details. But I suppose in terms of a couple of kind of quick tips and techniques, um, first off, I suppose, setting appropriate goals. So often when we procrastinate, what we'll do is we'll set what's called a negatively phrased goal. Uh, this sounds kind of subtle or it doesn't sound like it's it's something that's really going to have an effect but in terms of your motivational and your emotional response to the problem it can have a huge difference so we said we set a negatively phrased goal all that is is when we set a goal around what it is we want to stop or what it is that we want to avoid so for example i want to stop procrastinating you know and that sounds like a perfectly okay goal why would that be a problem but there's a couple of issues with it um one it's unachievable and I'll come back to that in a second, but, but the issue with you setting yourself a goal of, I don't want to procrastinate, you've always got the potential to procrastinate. So it's, it's always sitting there on your shoulder. So you're kind of focused on it and you're worried about it. Second thing is, I suppose, if you set a negatively phrased goal and it's unachievable, um, and you will, I mean, it's part of human nature, you will occasionally procrastinate. What are you going to do when you do procrastinate? You're going to start beating yourself up and you're going to start feeling guilt and shame, et cetera, around it. So what you want to do is you want to flip that and you want to set what's called a positively phrased goal. And all a positively phrased goal is, is when you phrase a goal around what it is you want to do, what it is you want to achieve. And you know, there's all kinds of models and stuff for doing that, but it's about setting a goal that is, I suppose, positive in that it's achievable, you know? Um, so say, rather than saying, I want to stop procrastinating, you might say, I want to get X amount of work done in the next two hours or whatever. So the thing, yeah. um, and the thing with that is that that starts to take advantage of this whole main source of positive emotion you have in your life. And that's when you're moving towards a goal that you think is important. The thing, other thing with a positively phrased goal like that is you can break it down. So often what I'll do with people, if it's... Um, got to do with performance around work or something like that, but you can definitely apply it to things like exercise, is like you can break it down to a very small kind of section. So for example, you know, um, your workout programs, maybe it's a case of, okay, I'm going to do 10 minutes of resistance training now. And so you get these time-based behavioral goals. And the thing with something that's small like that, one, as soon as you start, you're starting to feel that positive emotion of making progress, towards it but two because it's so much smaller you're much less likely to procrastinate around um sorry i'm not sure did that 
coherently absolutely answer the question because you can measure it as well and that's exactly. the thing if you can measure it you can see that you've been successful with it mm. whereas it's harder to measure the fact oh i didn't procrastinate well how do you prove that you haven't but you can prove that you got x amount of work done the next two hours mm. like, there's absolute gold so guys can you please comment helpful underneath if we're finding something from this Shian, hello massive welcome she is our first audit tomorrow congratulations Shian. Jane, good to see you. Hello, Jackie. So guys, if you're finding this helpful, please comment your learning. Please comment helpful and then a dash and comment your learning. Reason why is I want everyone else to learn from what you've taken from this. If we can consolidate the learning from this, it will be so much more powerful. Hello, Rashmi. Welcome to Elite. Claire Ellis, how are you? Susan Logan. Everyone's saying helpful, Jason. Everyone is saying helpful. Fantastic. Ooh. Love this. So you mentioned a few things about being kind to ourselves and about guilty as well i think well again i'm using myself as an example here i think i can be a very big critic for myself and sometimes i can be unkind to myself set unrealistic expectations and that can lead to a spiral of guilt sometimes as well if i didn't accomplish something when i told myself i was going to so if you looked at me as a client jason if i was to say to you that i can be my own biggest critic and oftentimes focus on the one thing in the day that I didn't manage to do rather than focus on everything else that I did accomplish. How would you go about tackling that? I know it's a big question, but any advice would be much appreciated. Two questions. Give me an example of uh, maybe some self-criticism you have, if you don't mind, sorry. I know Love it, not a problem. So one time of the you things, self-critical. Absolutely. So one of the things that... I've spoken to everyone in Elite about is one thing that I still need to focus on is focus. <laughs> so when I'm training, I find that I have like the idea fairy come into my mind about something I can do in TSD to improve the service or help someone or support a coach or help a client who I know is struggling. And it means that I struggle to put that down because I live and breathe it. So I'll stop training temporarily. I will then lose a bit of momentum. I'll go back into work temporarily and then I'll find that I've lost my focus and my workout is a bit dispersed. Mm. It makes me feel at the end of the day that I didn't train to the best of my capacity because I allowed myself to get pulled away from my training session. That would be a very common one for me, if that's helpful. Okay. And so what would be going through your head when you fail to kind of keep your focus? What would be, what would be the narrative? What would, be, what would you say to yourself? A brilliant question. Um, I would typically say, and I'm going to answer a few times here, um, yeah. oh, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. I better do it now so I don't forget it. I better do it now so I can help that person sooner. That's literally it. So urgency. Okay. And so that's the going away from it. But when you do it, so when you move away from, you know, when you lose your focus and you go, is the self-criticism then or is it at the end of the day? End of the day. And so what are you saying to yourself at the end of the day? I should have stayed more focused. I should have. I should have. I shouldn't right. have allowed. So the words should are associated with two emotions when they're overused. Like, and obviously, you know, mm. you have to take all this with a pinch of salt to an extent and, and not get too semantic about it. But the word should is often associated with guilt when we think about ourselves. And then when we think of what other people are going to think about us, it's related to shame. So I should have done this other people will think I should have done that, you know? And so if you're feeling this little bit of guilt or shame, which I'm going to guess that's, that's one or the two emotions. Is that close? Absolutely. Nail on the head. Yeah. And so it's the question with this, I suppose, is what was the impact of that guilt or shame on you? It'll gnaw at me until I go to bed, like for two yeah. hours and I'm trying to decompress and have downtime and not work, it'll, it'll, it'll be in the back of my head. And, and, what's the and what's the impact then of not getting that downtime and not turning your brain off? And it, it allows me to forget a lot of the wins that I had in the day because I focus on the one thing I didn't win on. Okay. So it, it's affecting your focus. It's obviously affecting your rest a little bit. And is it serving you? Absolutely not. No. So if I was to ask you, what might be a more helpful version of what you were saying to yourself? 
what might help you during reach your session? goal of staying focused? Huh? During the session or, or at the end of the day? No, at the end of the day. I mean, we'll just focus on that bit. I mean, um, <laughs> trying to be <laughs> sorry now. I'm going, not, I'm going to be not be unkind to myself because I know I have an audience as well. And I, actually, on a side note, and I'm not deflecting the question here. I, was, I find greater pressure with this because obviously it's my job to help everyone else be able to do yeah, this. Yeah. So if I ever find myself not being focused, I get imposter syndrome. How can I help anyone else do it if I can't manage it myself? Absolutely. Yeah. Don't we all? Um, yeah. I mean, hey, I, I teach this stuff and it's still there. It's yeah. basis. I know. Sorry, I never answered your question. No, though. no problem at all. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. But no, I, I, I want to answer. I, <laughs> I want to answer, absolutely. Just uh, to make the point, I suppose, in terms of what I do, it's it's very, I try not to come and give advice and tell people what they should think. What I'm all about is helping people figure out the most, I suppose, realistic and effective type of thinking that will work for them. And so that's why I'm, rather than telling you what's going on here, I'm just sort of demonstrating. So, like, if you were to think, if your goal is to, you know, I suppose, remain focused earlier in the day, but also to be able to relax and to, you know, recharge for those two hours, what might be a more helpful statement rather than I should have done it? Perhaps in future, maybe, or on reflection, or while I never X, Y, and Z, I need to acknowledge that I did X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z. Okay. I need to acknowledge I did X, Y, and Z. It wasn't perfect. You know, we got, you know, um, or I mean, one that people often could come up with when I kind of throw questions at them like that is actually, well, okay, how can I, how can I solve the problem? How can I, you know, set something up so that when I get ideas into my head, for example, that I have a system that, I can get them out of my head without doing what I'm doing besides my train or like without stopping my training or whatever it is. You know? I love that. And I, and I have done that like with pen and paper, just jot them down, note section on my phone, jot them down. And you actually get that feeling of satisfaction of just getting it out of your head. Mm. So actually, and I'm not answering my own question here. <laughs> Again, you've pulled it around, which is brilliant. What Jason is doing here is a client-centered approach. He's getting me to answer the question rather than him just dictate, which is so much more powerful. So if I was able to consistently remember that I get as much reward from taking notes on pen and paper and adding a success list for myself rather than dealing with there and then, it would gift me back two hours in the evening and it would mean that I didn't feel like I lost the day. That's what I'm kind of getting from what you said. Mm. Um, and this is the thing, I suppose, it's all very individual and it's all, you know, because different things are important to different people. Everyone's got different drives and motivation. It's just a case of starting to harness that. And I suppose you were kind of asking about this idea of the inner critic and, and us being hard on ourselves. Um, and, you know, this is the thing is, is, does it serve us? What's the impact of us criticizing ourselves? Is it helping us do what's important to us? Is it helping us? Um, do those kind of things. I mean, I think a really nice tool or question I often use around that is where, well, actually, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it with you again if you don't mind. Absolutely. Is, I want you to close your eyes to me. Yeah. I want you to imagine someone who you love and respect. I won't ask you a name now because we're in front of a lot of people, but have you got uh, the face of that person? Absolutely. Yeah. And so if that person, was had all the same resources you have was all this had all the same history has has experienced everything that you've experienced has done everything that you have done and they were saying to themselves i should have done more i should have done better i should be doing this and it was causing them to not be able to relax what advice would you give them Someone, what are you playing at stop beating yourself up have you not seen that you've managed to achieve this much, do that, do X, Y, and Z. Why do you keep? Yeah, I'm thinking of Babs <laughs> and I just, um, I would tell her off. <laughs> I would give her an awful talking to like. Yeah. Um, but yeah. coming from a very good place, obviously. Absolutely. Tough and why would you do that? Because I'd hate seeing her doing that to herself. 
because it, it and also it probably doesn't serve her i mean you can go at it from a few different angles but we tend to be a lot kinder we tend to be a lot more patient we tend to be a lot more objective with other people in a, a lot of the time than we are with ourselves well with other people we love and respect them i suppose that's why i put that in you know um and so it can be very important to remember that that you know you know would you treat your partner or would you treat your kid like you treat yourself you know um there's a guy called jordan peterson that i follow um and he's got a very good phrase for saying this it's like treat yourself as someone treat yourself like someone you're responsible for taking care of and he's very true that's you know that you are and i have use the expression would you speak to your best friend like that would you ask those questions of your best friend or someone you care about but what you did there jason was a, did a whole different level i think close my eyes made it so real because you obviously well i don't know about what this is your intention but i was visualizing bab straight away as soon as you did that i made you visualize the person and it made me actually think about where i'd be sitting on the couch giving out to her with kindness <laughs> in terms of not being so well hard on herself so um guys i'm hoping you've taken some value from this i mean so many people here are, are commenting below